The real problem was the nature of the Russian state. And we said that the Russian state was a form of capitalism. It wasn't a capitalism of private property. It was a state capitalism. But the essence of the capitalist society or modern society was the existence of the proletariat that was organized by capital. And the more capital developed, the more did it organize the proletariat so that the organization of the proletariat and the capitalist society seemed like an invasion. That's why we call it the invading socialist society, because capital accumulated what Marx called its own grave digger. That was the sense of invading. The first thing about it is the attempt by James to locate the Haitian Revolution in world revolution um, and the, the problems which emerge out of that attempt because one does get a sense that he has to twist or massage the the Haitian element uh, of the revolution to fit it in to what was taking place in the French Revolution at that time. And it's not necessarily um, true that every aspect of the Haitian Revolution could be seen in, a, in its corresponding um, European context, as it were. Um, now, I don't know what that teaches us about um, sociology, except that there is a tendency in the Caribbean, in these ex-colonies, for us to need to justify ourselves always in terms of something that is outside of us, external to us. In other words, what is happening here does not have a validity or a, a full validity in and of itself. It's got to be theoretically related to something else, something that is happening in the rest of the world. And in this case, it had to be justified with relation to something European. Mm -hmm. Now, in our literature, this frequently happens. I think a lot of, uh, say, a writer like Derek Walcott, um, who is fascinated by everything in the Caribbean, the landscape, the folklore, everything. But uh, this folklore uh, cannot be You can't utilize it fully, except you can relate it to something else. Mm. Carnival, for example, is a, uh, cannot be related to Trinidad Carnival. Had it to be related in, to the, 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 the Kabuki or no theater, uh, something in Japan. Its costumes, its masks, the types of the types of hero and villain that you find in no theater. Um, uh, before it gets the kind of validity that enables somebody like Walcott to work with this, to see the significance, it doesn't have an inherent significance of its own. And I'm not saying that C.L.R. James would did not see the Haitian Revolution as having an inherent significance of its own, but in order to interpret and to state what that significance was, 
it had to be fitted into an ideology. And that was the, 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 Jac the Jacobin ideology, the, the Jacobin movement in France. And that, that for me have, is what I, I think is most interesting about that. On the other hand, um, James was able to see this, the Haitian Revolution as a powerful and very dynamic narrative. Something that could become and should become the source of art. So he created a play out of the Black Jacobins. He created a play. He was able to see all those, all those characters in the Haitian Revolution as as theatrical figures but as sources of great theatre. There was a, a very human and a very dynamic story um, in the Haitian Revolution and he, he extracted that around the same time as he wrote The Black Jacobins and he wrote a play the characters and the play was enacted in London in the 1930s, I can't remember exactly when, 33 or 38 or something like that. And that I, that I think was, was quite remarkable, as, as remarkable as the, as, the, as, as the Black Jacobins itself. Now another aspect of the Black Jacobins is that it must have been the first time that the Haitian story was told by a Caribbean person, an African Caribbean person, who had a, a sense of the, the depth and the significance of it. You get the, that whole drama between the, the, um, the black African characters and the, the mulattoes, for example, in Haiti. The various roles that they played the, 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 the balance of forces, the betrayals, the, 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 you know, the loyalties, the disloyalties, um, and, and perhaps uh, it, it, it would take a Caribbean person to understand the dynamics of that revolution. Because although he was forcing it into the, 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 the French Revolution, making it parallel to the French Revolution or even a, a reaction to the French Revolution almost, a footnote to the French Revolution. There was a Caribbean, an African Caribbean story at the core of the Haitian um, Revolution that, and that story didn't evade James's um, notice at all. He, because it's, in essence, it's that story he's telling. The more powerful story that he is telling is a, is a Caribbean story, an African Caribbean story, an African Caribbean drama, whether or not it related to the French Revolution. And Constantine saw discrimination. He reacted to it. He didn't easily settle for you know, the kind of um, love, the kind of embracing that he got from the English society. He saw that and he saw through that as well. And in his books he, you know, he wrote on, on the color question, he wrote on discrimination, he wrote on it not only in England, the color question as a, as a universal phenomenon, while James was busy locating himself in Bloomsbury, locating himself among British radical intellectualism, um, locating himself to in terms of Marxist ideology, uh,
once a time was zeroing in on the concrete issues of race, you know. And James would say that he he couldn't recognize Constantine. Uh, he couldn't recognize Constantine. And I because Constantine was seeing race where for James the, 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 the issue was class. Yes. Um, but it's not that James did not recognize Constantine. I don't think that James is encountering British society on the same level. And when Constantine returned here to, um, both he and James returned, they were both in the People's National Movement. Constantine was in the cabinet. James um, was running the, the party newspaper. Um, their ways of understanding what was taking place in Trinidad were different. Their, their reactions to things like South Africa and apartheid were different. It was the, the, the question of Frank Worrell in the early 60s um, being invited to take a team to, to, to South Africa. And Constantine definitely no. And James said, yes, he should take the team. It would expose South Africa, it would expose apartheid. And, um, so you saw the the two directions um, between these two men, these, these two men. Um, yeah, they were good friends and they'd come out of more or less the same area. Constantine from Aruka, I think, but then comes to, 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 to Napuna. In fact, who I best bought his house. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a funny kind of continuity there. Mm -hmm. And uh, James out of um, Aruka and both of them sort of self-made intellectuals because Constantine didn't only play cricket, he, he eventually he, he trained as, a, as an attorney. Um, so that you have two different journeys taking place there. But James is embraced by a sector of the society that uh, Constantine would not have probably felt comfortable in. Mm. Uh, yeah, that sort of intellectual, theoretical <laughs> sector that is not facing anything mm. concrete at all. Kind of reminds us of the choice that James made in the Beyond the Boundary when he was faced with a darker team or a lighter team. And yes. He chose to go with a lighter team, whereas yes. Constantine was with a darker team. Yes, that's right. And he could have been a better cricketer if he had joined the darker team. Constantine <laughs> told him, "We could have made a cricketer out of you." <laughs> <laughs> yes, because because James was always interested in the in the social element of the thing. Mm -hmm. And that lighter team con con contained um, people maybe with the same intellectual interests, uh, you know. Um, and that, that, was, that, that, was, that was the difference mm -hmm. socially. Um, James is always dialoguing with um, the, the, the very people, in fact, that he might have to, to change or transform if, if he were to achieve the sort of society that he was always talking about. What I'm, what I'm saying is, take uh, the question of how James presents the riot at the Queen's Park Oval and uh, the campaign for Frank Burrell's captaincy. And he's saying that 
the last thing he wanted to do was to put a racial interpretation on what happened at the over the bottom throwing. The last thing he would keep race out of his analysis, even in the campaign for Warrella's captaincy. Clearly, I mean, race was at the center of that. Why was it that West Indies could have no black cricket captain, even though the best cricketers and the most experienced and everything were black? A week's worry walk that whole side. They were all better qualified than Dennis Atkinson and Alexander and Franz Alexander and that, that John Goddard. But why is it that these men are not fit to captain the rest of these teams? Of course it's racist, staring you in the face, staring everybody in the face. And James is telling us that race is the last thing that he would want to bring in to his argument for the race. Okay. Um, he then tells us that um, of his friendship with these business people and so on. People whom he had taught in school and with whom he seemed to have a kind of arrangement. It's the same thing. Um, now these are the very types of people who would keep somebody like Warren out of the team. But James is part of that that circle. Um, or if not part of the circle, he, he compromises with them all the time. It's the same compromise all along the line. Mm. Uh, Do you think the same compromise applies to his interpretation of Hegel? Because Hegel was very anti-African. Yes, but yes. Hegel, every page, James bows down to Hegel in his reading of uh, Hegel's logic mm -hmm. more than he does to any other person. He is much more critical of the Africans and the African mm -hmm. Caribbean that he has written about yes. than he was of Hegel. He worships Hegel. What was that about? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. But... I would, I, would, I would say that one would have to go back to the, to the 30s, to that Bloomsbury intellectual community that he, he joined as a, a kind of phenomenon, you know. Mm -hmm. um, here is this guy from the colonies and he knows all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? he is a, He's a phenomenon to them. Yes. He's something that he will put in a museum or something. Mm. <laughs> put a display. And uh, it may well be that discussing Hegel, um, digging Hegel, might have been part of that whole scenario. To impress his colleagues. Well, maybe. Yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe he was impressed by Hegel. I don't know. He was. He said that some many people, professors, read and translated Hegel, but claimed that they did not understand him, yes. and that he saw it as a challenge for him to understand what Hegel was talking about. Okay. But he could have still done that as critically as he did engage with other writers, yes. African Caribbean, African writers, mm -hmm. and then he took a lesson from Hegel that I thought was a, a blunder. Mm. The lesson being that the party, the political party, is not necessary for organizing the people to make a change in their lives. Mm. And that what needs to be done is to return to spontaneity of the individual acting when they felt that it was necessary to act in a given situation, that the party had to be uh, dissolved, as mm. it were. And I thought that was weird uh, mm. as an orientation from a pol a political philosopher or a political well, sociologist. Did he, uh, did he though, um, retain that, that that fixation, that position? I don't think he did. I think that James was a very pragmatic kind of person. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, 
I mean, it's, it's difficult to know where he was working, okay? He was not, okay, he worked as a journalist, he wrote articles and that sort of thing. How did he keep alive this part, maybe of a group, maybe of a movement, who recognized his powers as an intellectual and who conspired to keep him alive? Now, um, as a, a Caribbean survivalist, in that kind of situation, what you will learn to do is to play the game, is to adapt your message, your line of reasoning to the objective circumstances within which you find yourself so that James, J James might not have continued to support her. Yeah. I mean, then later on, when Walter Rodney um, gets killed in Guyana, James's reaction to this is that um, he should have known better um, than to challenge Burnham. You know. Uh, now James would James would have run from that situation. James would have recognized that it was not worth <laughs> trying to create a revolution in a place like Guyana. He would have gone. He ran from Trinidad when he confronted Williams and the, 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 the PNM and it was very clear that there was going to be a head-on collision between the two. And Williams wouldn't have anything to do with James's fixation on ideology and Marxism. Um, and that you know, members of the party too were whispering and ganging up against him. He left the place. He didn't stay to fight it out. And when he returned, uh, he returned to cover the Australian series in 1965, and Williams put him under a, a kind of curfew. Um, and then he, he returned uh, to lead the Workers and Farmers Party, doing precisely what all his life he had said you should not do. That is, you shouldn't come, you, you, you had to educate the masses. You know, there had to be a considerable amount of ideological education which is what he wanted to, to use the, the nation for. Um, you had to educate them. I, I, before you couldn't go into anything like elections and so on. And of course they lost all their deposits. As he could have said, but the question is, why did he come back to lead a political party to a country that he had, you know, he had been distant from, apart from the four or five years, if that much, back with the PNM, he was still very much an unknown element to the masses of people in Trinidad. Mm. Why did he? Why did he do that? So what I'm, what I'm seeing, and I mean I don't want to disparage CLR, but I'm seeing a, a man who <clears throat> very pragmatic, adapts to circumstances and is not and he's not beyond um, shifting his position or abandoning his, his position he probably better like that yeah he's not he's not beyond abandoning positions which he might have held for a long time when it seems somehow 
advantage us to do so. Um, so that um, in criticizing Rodney, he might have been criticizing himself in a way. You know, what, what Rodney did, Rodney came back to Guyana. Burnham made it very clear that they were at war, he wasn't going to get a job. Rodney did not accept the signal because if you understood that signal, you would leave Guyana. That's what Burnham is telling you, leave before mm. <laughs> this fight becomes nastier. You're going to start by starving you. We're going to end up by killing you. So leave at the point where we start and go and find that work somewhere else. This is basically the signal. Um, Rani undertakes a program of worker education, you, um, which is, you know, bottom house, bottom house schools, bottom house education, CLR. And then, the, 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 it's using Guyana begin to escalate. So they be, um, the WPA is making some headway, but not really that much. They begin to escalate. The confrontation becomes more direct. The PNM's party headquarters is burned down. Burnham says it's Rodney and his group, but essentially has no proof of this. One or two of the, the um, members of the WPA get killed actually. All, all the signals were, were building up, you know. I'm saying that Rodney's encounter with home in the Caribbean was again a concrete encounter with a, a, a very dangerous situation. CLR's encounter has always been, except for the Workers and Farmers Party, has always been an abstract encounter. Intellectual encounter. When he has, when Sierra has to face the concrete situation, which is always dangerous. In other words, when he, if he has to face the reality of revolution in whatever disguise revolution presents itself, Sierra gone. Mm. He's not, <laughs> because this. Concrete encounter is always going to demand uh, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And uh, Theodore was too much of a smart person, a pragmatist, to give his life for that. He, he had to stay alive to inspire the revolution. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think you just answered my final question about his sociology of education, the idea that you can only educate the people by organizing with them mm -hmm. and working on the ground to achieve something, mm -hmm. which is what Rodney was doing. Yes. Um, in that sense, would, do you think uh, CLR could have achieved more in terms of political education if he was uh, directly engaged throughout his life in building a mass movement, for example? Um. I don't know. No. I'm thinking now of Naipaul's portrait of CLR in that short story, On the Run, mm. in um, Away in the World. Mm. And what he essentially is saying is that to be a revolutionary, you need a country. You need, <laughs> you need a particular place and a particular people and a particular set of circumstances and you are fighting up 
within these circumstances. Um, you can't just educate them and then run when they get <laughs> <laughs> you, got to, you, you got to be there, you got to know that there is going to be fighting. And that what you call education is going to be interpreted as sedition, subversion, or whatever. They're going to put pressure um, What are you going to do when they put this pressure? Um, okay, so... Now Paul's interpretation really is that Sailor I was a smart guy. <laughs> Just a, you know, familiar. Um, he would be out of the place and onto another place. But that to be successful, you've got to be there and there all the time. Mm. And m most likely you will fail. I don't know how many revolutions have succeeded. You know, you know, the gain one sticks true. But most likely you would have failed. Um, now it may very well be that there is a place for the kind of person that CLR was, somebody who inspires groups of people to think and then leaves them to work out the terms Protocol. of their own engagement. Mm in the society um, and that is probably what his real value is mm. you know the, the inspiring people to think about their situation and um, but it's he, he is not the person who's leading you on the on the front line mm. you know um, he's not going to be there that's like i'm saying the one time that he, he, he tried it was with the yeah, yes but he but, after he lost, hmm. he was out of here again, <laughs> almost permanently out of here because he would come back from time to time. The, the OWTU, George Weeks, would accommodate him. Um, I mean, literally, he would house whenever he came and facilitate his, him, you know. But um, he was a revolutionary without any specific country. Okay, you got, you got Che Guevara doing that, mm. um, but he dies in Bolivia. Yeah. Um, again, probably betrayed because he he didn't belong and mm. he didn't. Foreigner. Huh? A foreigner. Yeah, yeah. Very vulnerable. Yes. Very, very vulnerable.